Um, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are. We are in the UK. Um, so for us, it's six or seven in the evening. Uh, we have as our guest tonight, Jancis Robinson, who is in North London. I'm a little bit to the southwest of London. And we have my partner in crime here, Polly Hammond, who is in Barcelona. And welcome to all, I think, 30 or so of you who've already arrived. And um, thank you, Jancis, so much for giving us... Pleasure. Lovely time. view you've got there. Is that real well, or is that one of your backdrops? No, that is real. That is actually half an hour ago. I went out to get my, my hourly, my, my one bit of exercise today, and I literally grabbed a shot of that. So that's uh, 45 minutes ago. Very so, Jancis, I was just thinking that we've got the, the, the name of, of this, whatever we're doing here, this webcasting, is The Real Business of Wine. And the funny thing is when you and I first met, which I calculate as being 1981 or 82, you were editor of something called Wine and Spirit International, which was that, a, business, a trade magazine. I think. Well, it, well, that was my start in yes. wine editing as assistant editor of a wine trade magazine, Wine and Spirit, which no longer exists, sadly. Mm. Um, but actually, that was only from 1st of December 75 until sometime in 1980. So it was even longer ago. <laughs> I went <laughs> right. freelance in 1980. And you and then... And taken you, on by the Sunday Times, yeah. And, and you started your newsletter around that sort of time. I Drinker's mean, Digest of Blessed yes. Memory, yes. Um, which literally, I started with a boyfriend and we literally pounded the pavements and stuck it through likely looking letterboxes um, in, you know, well-heeled neighbourhoods that looked as though they had people interested in wine in them. And somewhere around Highbury Fields, uh, Islington, uh, a woman came out <laughs> the front door, padded down the, the pavement, handed it back to us and said, there's quite enough trouble in the world without this sort of thing. Thank you very much. Uh, but, but I mean, those were, I mean, those are prehistoric times. Because I beg your pardon. Go, well, they were, <laughs> I was around then, but they were prehistoric, in wine terms, they were prehistoric <laughs> in the sense that, I mean, your husband, Nick, was one of, was also a pioneer um, because he was, his restaurant, the Scargo, was one of the first places in London, where you could buy Californian wine and top Australian wines, as I, as I, as I recall, wasn't it? it? But certainly it had an all uh, American wine list when it opened. Yeah. Apart from, I think there was House Champagne. And it was also, I think, that I obviously helped put the wine list together. And I think it was the first wine list in Britain, if not the world, to show wines by style. Mm. Uh, than by yeah. geography or grape or something like that. Uh, but we pretty soon realized that California and Oregon and Washington could not provide, at that stage, hmm. wines with the sort of acidity and freshness and lightness of, I say, a Muscadet and a Sancerre that were terribly popular then, so, uh, and a Chablis. So we added those pretty quickly. And that was in the middle of Soho, in the in the days when Soho was was actually raunchier, I think, than, than it is. Uh, in, everyone in said current time. Nick was mad to be opening in Soho. In he opened in eighty one, and uh, that was when Soho was supposedly the pits. He also another first was that uh, it had a menu in English, which mm. was incredibly rare then. And, and Nick I... had a tertiary education, which was in, and was British which was very, very rare for, for a London restaurateur. And it was strange to say, I think the Australian Wine, so I think Australian wine Centre in those days where the, the promotional body for Australia was also in amongst That's the strip, was, strip clubs yeah. in uh, Soho yes, as well. Yeah, as yeah, around but, the corner, very dusty it was. <laughs> so, so looking back over that time, I mean, in those days, uh, Bordeaux was, was a lot more affordable. Burgundy was uh, well, also... Hang on, sorry, I, you're not mm. um, going to keep interrupting here. No, that's the whole point. Got that's a whole point. hour to finish. Yes. <laughs> um, you say Bordeaux was affordable. One of my beefs is that although some Bordeaux is just ludicrously expensive, I still maintain that Bordeaux is one of the best hunting grounds at the moment for value. People don't. Yeah, do. A lot of people don't realise yeah. that. But at the bottom end, okay, yes. you're not going to get great value at five pounds a bottle, but you fantastic 
value at sort of seven to 15 pounds a bottle. Absolutely. No, sorry, I was, I was being, I was sort of talking about the sort of the big names yeah. that some of us could afford yeah, yeah. to stray into sort of Poyac and Margot and Von Romanet and, and Volney rather more regularly maybe than, than, than we could think of doing so today. Um, and in terms of the people that you've been talking to over that period, through the Financial Times and everywhere else, how has that changed? How have people, what, what, people's attitude to wine, have you seen some, some sort of changes in the way people are, are looking at wine? I suppose because I, the people I'm writing for, you know, started off being in the wine and spirit trade, then they were readers of the Sunday Times, which was a big mass uh, readership because the Sunday Times was the, the biggest selling weekend paper in, in Britain. Um, then going to the FT, the Financial Times, where it is assumed that if you can afford the Financial Times, you've got a fair bit of disposable income. So I suppose I was getting a little bit more towards wine enthusiasts, real wine enthusiasts, rather than the general public. Um, and the, the FT, pretty soon after I joined, which was I think 1990, started to become a global paper. And that has dovetailed very nicely with JanicesRobinson.com, which of course, if you have a website, it's global too. So I'm well used to write, I hope, writing for a, a an international readership rather than just a, a British readership. And if, if I mention Sainsbury's, I have to say UK supermarket, you know, that sort of thing. Um, I think people are much more, I mean, it's obvious, but much more open and, and wide ranging in the sort of um, wines they want to want to buy. And it's certainly it's good. I mean, Bordeaux does make a heck of a lot of good wine, but it's good to see its, its monopoly on fine wine being broken. And at long last in Britain, we're getting decent Italian wines because we've really lagged behind the US in particular and Germany and Switzerland terribly in that respect. And in terms of, um, I mean, the, the Atlas is the obvious thing to, to mention at this point, because that's- The World what, Atlas of Wine. Yes, yeah. uh, which you've recently, well, 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 well plugged, is the, which, which is- The uh, Atlas? Right, I mean, sit, it be anything. <laughs> it is sit, sitting on my table here. Um, what, and I knew you've been asked this in other times, but really in the, the countries that really excite you that wouldn't have been there or the regions, um, well, it was funny, the other day I went to see when New Zealand was fir first got its own coverage in the World Atlas of Wine, which after all has been going since 1971. And I think it wasn't until the fourth edition. Mm. I mean, incredibly, really. Um, uh, you know, God, how it's changed. I think now it's eight or ten pages. Um, Places that really excite me, well, they change with every edition, but yeah. I'm a huge fan of both Portugal and Greece because they have remained so faithful to their own very rich array of indigenous grape varieties. And I mean, like everybody, they had their, their dose of people who planted Cabernet and Chardonnay and all the rest, but much less than other countries. Um, so it's, it's there for us to plunder and, and so many of them have really interesting character. I mean, and as you know, I've long been a fan of and, and interested particularly in grape varieties. Mm. One of my early books in 1986 was Vines, Grapes and Wines. I'm not plugging that because I don't do <laughs> it, but um, I've always been interested in that. And um, it's not the case that if a grape is weird and, and rare, the wine it produces is, is bound to be fantastic. That's not the case at all. And I, I think there are an awful lot of obscure grapes that deserve their obscurity. But there, there are hundreds of grapes that would not be known to, let's say, the general public that have massively individual characters and, and deserve more attention, which is exciting. And are getting it now. Talking about the, that book, around that sort of time, you also did a book on, which was, I thought, one of the most uh, ambitious things that I'd seen anyone do at the time, which was trying to look at when wines would be drinkable yeah. and their lifespans and so on. Yeah. 
Again, um, not a plug, because it's not <laughs> no, no, but I, it was, but my, my thought on that was, how do you think our attitude to wine aging has changed? Because Michel Bertin has, has made the point that nowadays, very few people understand tertiary flavors or look for tertiary flavors when we're all being driven to look for fruit. Um, are you seeing that or uh, is, do you think that we haven't changed as much as, as people think? I think it's slightly the other way around that produce, there aren't as many producers nowadays that are bothering to make wines that are designed to age. Mm -hmm. And, and you've got the glue glue phenomenon. I see you're glue gluing. Okay. I'm glue gluing. I'm gluing a very, very old. I oh, well can done. see it. An anti. Let's see if we can get this. Um, I'm not sure they can show it. Um, no, you can't. It's a Penley Estate 1991 Shiraz Cabernet from, from uh, Kunawara. So um, venerable and, and good. Very nice. My favourite tasting note. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Um, I'm hope, basically, I'm going to invite, I'm going to actually put somebody on the, the carpet, on the, bring them to the podium, whether they're asking to or not. Lentz Moser is sitting in the audience, and I'd love Lentz to, Lentz, the Austrian... Did, he, did you get back to Austria from China, Lentz? I'm just hoping he can hear us, so I'm just unmute him, because he's at the moment, he's muted, or he may be trying to avoid talking to us, I can't see. Um, Lentz, can you hear us? I don't know. Um, but you've been to Austria, you've been to China. How many times have you been to China? Every other year this century. Um, hold on, there he is. He's trying. I Lentz, can't see him. are you there? So every other year, and that's and so this, what? Do, what if you? What have you seen changing in China that's really Ooh. interested you? Well, each time I go, I tried to go to a different wine region. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are all very different, with most of them with massive challenges. That, ah, hi, hello. Hi, hi, <laughs> Lance. Daughter getting you online. Oh, oh my God. It took me a while to come to grips with technical <laughs> stuff here. Thank you. And you're in Austria now? Yes, I'm in Austria, yeah. And I, I thought, um, you know, since, since I follow uh, both of you on Instagram, and um, Robert in particular, I thought um, I, I'll join you tonight. Yeah, You're I'm very welcome. I, I returned from China about two months ago, so it's all good. Good, 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 good. Yeah. So tell me what's happening in China at the moment, when, when you were last... Well, uh, I, I had China on the phone three times today. I mean, via WeChat call, as you might know. And mm -hmm. uh, they are celebrating because uh, Xi Jinping has a direct access to Mr. Uh, COVID-19. And they decided to, to uh, finish or terminate the whole thing. And so they are back to business, basically. I mean, all in, in all seriousness, China is really trying to come, come to grips with normal life again. And they kind of uh, are bewildered what's happening in Europe, if I may say. Um, yes, I've been told, I was talking to Ian Ford, whom we both ah. know, uh, who he's in, um, we all know, I think, who is uh, in the States at the moment. He was saying that everything he's hearing from his offices in China is that things are actually bouncing back surprisingly quickly in the places where things are opening. I don't know if you're hearing that. Well, I'm not so sure. I talked to, to, um, to Simon Wong, who is the CEO of ASC last Friday. And um, in March, he's down 70%, according to what he told me. And mm. um, so what, what, what's, what's, what he's estimating is that if the weather is nice now in Shanghai, uh, for the next couple of weeks, then it gradually will come back to life. So especially the on-trade, obviously off-trade sales has, have been strong anyway, internet anyway, that's the same phenomenon yeah. we have here as well. But um, he sees China recovering over the next uh, three months, gradually. So it's not going to happen overnight with a big part. I do hope that happens because certainly the last time I was there, which was a year ago, it felt much more depressed and, and not, not in that great expanding building mode. You know, it, it, it really felt qualitatively different. And, and, it, and trade wasn't great, was it? Long before uh, Mr. COVID-19. No, no, long before. I mean, uh, I, I gave a speech on Wine to Wine in Verona, and Robert knows this, uh, in, in November or December last year. And uh, the figures um, from the Chinese wine industry have been uh, down for years. 
And uh, what's even more worrying that the figures on, on imports were down as well, quite significantly, and you can imagine what's happening now. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> I'm very, very confident because uh, all of the new wine entering China and a lot of good stuff produced in China itself will basically um, make sure that the wine industry is growing again very soon after this crisis. But the, the, the picture was really uh, gloom and doom uh, before Christmas, that's for sure, already. Mm. So, uh, and what do you think, um, this is Jancis, in terms of what your expectation for China in the next few years, what do you, what do you think we're going to see? Are we going to see more of the sort of the LVMH super cuvées from, from high altitude odd places or are we going to see um, interesting wines made from other grapes? What, what do you think? I don't, I mean, that area well, one good point, I suppose, is that the weather seems to be changing in, chi in China's favor, or rather in um, eastern China's fa favor, so that the, the monsoons, which were the, the problem, seem to be getting less of a problem. So perhaps, um, you know, where Lafitte is isn't such a crazy idea now. Mm, yes. I don't, I mean, Lentz, you're the person to know how receptive foreign markets are for Chinese wine. You've been a real pioneer of exporting good, sensibly priced Chinese wine. Um, but I, I still think it's going to be a long haul for Chinese wine, people to actually go out and actively seek Chinese wine, except as a novelty. But, you know, novelty oh. will keep going, I think. <laughs> and our, our mutual friend René Gabriel always says, he always says, Lens, nobody's waiting for your Chinese <laughs> wine, <laughs> for China altogether. I think that's a fair statement. But I tell you one thing, I, I, I talked to about 80 uh, CEOs, uh, journalists uh, and friends over the last uh, 10 days on the phone, WeChat, whatever, in order to find out the, the mood uh, internationally. And um, very much to my surprise, I talked to three customers and new customers as well, one from Switzerland, one from Canada, and one from Italy. And they said, Lenz, when we are going to open our shops again, we're going to do it with your wine. And this was a big surprise. It was not my idea. Uh, you know me, I'm a salesman as well, not just a winemaker. But they said, we want to open with a big bang where people think we are crazy. And really, they, they really mentioned crazy. Um, because 50% will say crazy, but 50, the other 50% will say, well, maybe if, if you know, Schuller from Switzerland or, or Merigali Group from Italy or uh, SAQ from, from Canada, uh, they have an idea um, behind this. So people will talk again, because I think we, we were going to open the shop again, either with a big bang or it's going to be very, very slow. And I, I, I want to move things, as you know. Thank you very much for, oh, for that. Okay. Let's go ahead, chances. Uh, nope, nope, no. Nope. I don't have anything in particular to say. So you normally, chances, you would, you'd be actually on your way to um, to Bordeaux at this point, would you? Uh, I uh, was planning at most a, a dream family holiday to celebrate a big birthday, and Julia was going to go to Bordeaux. Ah, okay, yes. Um, and how do you feel I am, about I have cornered the market in British Airways vouchers <laughs> in <exchange laughs> cancelled flights. <laughs> um, my question is, how do you feel about the fact that on Prima, I mean, there are some of us, I, I certainly, to be honest, I wasn't planning to go this, this year. Um, and, but I, I, I love tasting the wines later on, but I have questions over the whole on Prima circus. I don't know how you feel about it. Oh, well, you should if you read. I've, I've been banging yes. on about it for years, I'm afraid. <laughs> well, that's, I'm giving you the opportunity to go into that. <laughs> it's just, I think it's just crazy to be tasting these wines this young. Um, you know, just a few months in barrel. I'm Embryonic gonna... liquids, years from being at, at, um, ready to drink. Um, and my other point is that actually selling Bordeaux en Prima is relatively recent. You know, it, everyone acts as though it's sort of an age-old tradition, but 
it only started in the early 70s as a response to the, the oil crisis then. Everything's a response to crisis. It, it, actually, funny um, enough, Burgundy, the whole Burgundy grower thing was the same time, precisely that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and it would be much more sensible for, for ev from all points of view, I think, to launch the wines later. I, ideally, as far as I'm concerned, when they're in bottle. But that may well be a step too far for the Bordelais. I'd like to invite Daniele De, De Vecchi, who I don't know if you've met Daniele, who's, de, who's going to be speaking on Monday um, about the, the, the 2019 harvest, but um, his, his business really is, is involved in looking at the vineyards from satellites and from weather patterns. Daniele, what, how do you feel about, about this whole, do you think we should be looking at winers in this way? Are you there? Well, uh, from, from our point of view, we can for sure help in, in cases such as this year where as as everybody knows no one can travel there so we can provide inns uh, when that can just come from from producers and at the same time we don't we we feel that we don't of course uh, can we cannot substitute uh, uh, official uh, let's say official critics and tasters but we can we can provide uh, we can provide uh, ins that um, to, uh, otherwise would not be available. So, do you think that in the future we're going to be looking at data to tell us when a vintage is good, rather than people like uh, critics actually saying? Uh, I think it's going to be an hybrid solution, meaning that data is going to to come into play more and more. And I think it's um, somehow also necessary to improve the, the transparency and to, uh, I think that also uh, one thing is that uh, consumers are, are going to get used to data and uh, you have to provide them um, data as well to also in the wine industry. Chances. Uh, you, how, well, I, I wish that? you the very, very best of luck, Daniele, with getting <laughs> maximum data out of Bordeaux chateaus. I had an idea about maybe 20 years ago to write a book called The Bordeaux Archive. And it would, for every chateau and every vintage, it would give you all the information that you wanted, like when it was picked, the asom precise assemblage, how many treatments, all that kind of thing. And I put it to, I think I, think I put it to Jean-Michel Caz of Chateau Langebarge first, because he's very outward looking and, and amenable. And um, he, he looked a bit doubtful, but said, well, I'll discuss it with my colleagues. <laughs> I'll put it uh, to the, I don't know, some one of their sort of mm. investigations. And I never got any reply to my request, but the next dinner that that association organized in my plasma, which in the past had always been, I don't notice these things, but you know, would normally be <laughs> maybe at the table with the first growth or something. I was put at the sort of outer rim next to one of the most underperforming Chateau's owner. Uh, so I sort of got my, my response to that idea. So I don't know how I, I I don't know how you're going to get the data, but I wish you the best of luck because it would be lovely to have it. I think Daniele, I think I'll just unmute you. I think you you are looking at it from actually you're talking about sort of using weather patterns and satellite data rather than relying on the on the estates. Can you briefly is that is that correct? Yes, yes, you're right. Uh, we we are not asking directly the data to to, to the chateaus. Uh, we just have the the maps. We we have to know where they are located, where their pulse their pulses are located, and then we look at the weather data close to there. Uh, and the parcels we look at are so um, uh, intermingled, aren't they? You know, we 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 tend to think of Bordeaux chateaus as being one contiguous block, but they're absolutely not, are they? No. No, no, no. They, they have specific plots and... And then they from, keep exchanging. <laughs> that's true as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well from, from what we, we noticed also that the patterns are different according to the different plot because of the different exposure to the sun, because of different orientation and so on and so forth. So you see from the different producers, you see different patterns. Uh, okay.
Thank you, Daniele. Like keeping oh, up with the Muexes, that's what I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Chances, in terms of looking at young wines, or any wines, the, the obvious next question has to be um, points and scores and all the things that, you know, basically when you started, I think Decanter was still marking out of was it 10 or 20 or whatever. You've never been a, a, a fan of, of the whole score. I'm not, I see thing, scores as a, as a necessary evil in a way um, that I've certainly lived through times when wine has been certain wines, certain wine regions or vintages have been red hot. And to get your allocation, you have, as a consumer, you've got to jump in really, really quickly. And that uh, giving a, a number helps people who don't have time to actually read the notes, which are far more valuable than, than just numbers. Um, and, I, and when I started JanicesRobinson.com, that was true of quite a lot of wines and it was, sufficient justification um, to me for giving wines a score. And I, I go, I, we score out of 20 because we're European and that's what we do. And I, I actually don't have a grasp, I'm afraid, personally, of a 100-point scale. It's just not something that's ever um, been important in my education or my life. So um, I'm sure it, I'm, I'm a dinosaur not to have converted to 100 points. And I think guys. It's, I think the, the people funny noise can't really hear. Have we lost Robert's connection? All right, we'll let him jump in in just a minute. But in the meantime, I have a litany of questions okay. <laughs> from folks who can't be here tonight. And as we are recording this, let's sure. go ahead and jump let's into go. some of those. Yeah. Okay, so the realities of tech. I'll keep going and Robert will come in. Um, how do you anticipate journalists, bloggers, and wine critics in general can help growers to emerge from this crisis out, uh, after confinement? Mm. Growers. Uh, or we can make that more general and just no, say no, our wine. It's, it's a good question. I mean, I, I'm, because we're just going into this period, I'm busy thinking of ways to help the people who are most immediately affected, like hospitality uh, professionals and things like that. Um, and consumer and, and wine retailers and putting wine retailers in touch with wine consumers. And I haven't started to think about wine producers yet. I mean, they, they're, as far as I can see, the, the biggest short-term problem is producers in places where their governments are insisting that there's a lockdown mm. and they've got ferments going on, that kind of thing. That seems to be happening in, in Australia. Um, but I don't think I can personally help with that for the moment. Um, but when, when they come out, I will, I will start to think a bit, but the, the trouble is everyone is going to be in the same boat. And so how do we help everyone other than just continuing to do our job, which is telling people the truth, which is wine is the most fantastic beverage and you should drink it every night. Sure. Okay. If we back that up then and look at what is what the problems that we're currently dealing with. So how do you think that wine and winery in general can use our voice to support the hospitality who has, you know, they're our gateway to our customers and they're struggling yeah. right now? Well, I feel really, really sorry for the hospitality industry, not least because our son is a restaurateur in London. He's got four restaurants. Fortunately, he's also got a shop and a, and a wine bar and He's had to close all four and, well, I won't go into that. But anyway, at his suggestion, we are offering complimentary membership of my website, jancesromson.com, to any uh, hospitality professional who's just been laid off until the end of May. Um, and it, the, we only put this offer out uh, sort of 26 hours ago and we have been absolutely overwhelmed, deluged. Mm -hmm. But everybody has a lovely story. Well, not everybody, but um, we ask them to suggest a, a food and wine combination that they know works really well. 
And there are so many lovely little stories in, in what they've said. Slightly worrying number of people say, I'm drinking um, you know, Chardonnay with popcorn at the moment. And that's my diet, that's my quarantine diet. But, <laughs> but we can forgive them, just like our bad tech yeah. can, can yeah, you know, yeah. allow for those things. Yeah, yeah. So um, Robert is experiencing a bad connection, uh, just so everyone knows. You have been on the forefront of digital communications for a very long time before it was de rigueur for wine communicators. How are you seeing that changing amongst your peers, but also the impact of consumer or prosumer communications in the face of, of this confinement? Uh, I'm, I never ever thought when I started my website 20 years ago that I was creating a sort of almost virus-proof business. I mean, that's obviously not something you'd ever think of, but here it is, it's, it's functioning. In fact, everybody seems to want to communicate far more. Uh, I'm having far more people sending me articles because they have a strong feeling about this situation. Um, uh, I hope people are wanting to read them. I'm slightly worried that, that the content is being totally um, virus and disease dominated and mm -hmm. I have to work at making sure that we keep some good things and some happy things and keep recommending specific wines. Um, but I, I just feel so lucky that actually I, my working life is hard, apart from being run off my feet because of various, uh, we're, we're also running a list of wine retailers all over the world who are prepared to deliver to people staying at home. Um, my working life hasn't really changed. I'm, I'm just, as Nick will tell you, I'm just sitting at my desk all day <laughs> typing away. And, and we've always, we've got a team of about 15 people now, and we've always been home workers wherever we are in the world. So it hasn't directly um, affected how, how my website works, actually. Um, you... but, but trying to help people as much as possible. Do you see that there is now an evolution amongst your peers who maybe felt like, you know, what you were doing 20 years ago was completely out of the box maybe. and now they're looking I, I, at you and yeah. saying, hmm. I remember famous, well, uh, Robert will know Malcolm Gluck. Can Robert yep. hear me? <clears throat> don't think so. I can hear you. I can hear you. Yes. I don't you can hear me. I can now hear you, yes. Yeah. And you will remember Malcolm Gluck, who was a yes. Guardian newspaper yes. columnist. And this was in 2000. He, when he learned that I was starting up a website, he said, uh, um, you'll never make a success of it. Um, and if you do, I'll buy you dinner with a really good bottle of Burgundy at the Fat Duck. And I could, even that early on, I think it was when I launched a year in a, sub a subscription model, no ads, no sponsorship, but subscription. Uh, that's when he said, this will never work. I could, uh, even at that- Did you ever get the, did you ever get the dinner? He, when <laughs> it was clear that I'd won the bet, he reduced the steak to supper at his place, which I, I declined. <laughs> I didn't think it was a very good swap for dinner oh. at the Fat Duck with a very good bottle of Burgundy. <laughs> uh, Chances, I don't know if you, I, I'm hoping you can hear you, that I think one of the things that comes out of that question was that Malcolm Gluck was famous for trying to set up a value for money uh, index, as it were. You would say, um, this wine is, 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 is pretty good and it's very cheap, therefore it got a very high mark. And this wine is very good, but it's very expensive, so it got a lower mark. Um, how do you feel about that whole value for money aspect? I'm very, very keen on value for money, personally. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, I, I, and certainly when I'm writing tasting notes and giving a score, we have a sort of in-house, we, we go GV for good value and occasionally VGV and sometimes a BVGB, and, and I'm, I'm very conscious of that. Um, even, you know, doing big, blind, horizontal tastings of a Bordeaux vintage, um, I, I'll even put a GV in there because sometimes you can come across, say, a sort of fifth growth or a uh, Cru Bourgeois that scores really well among its peers of much, much more expensive wines. 
Um, so I, I think that's the way to do it, actually. I, I, I think jolly difficult to come up with a scoring system, just one number that takes into account both price and, and quality. But you've got all these, these wines today that are, I think mean, we were both at Gerard Basset's, the, the celebration of his life, and there was a bottle of wine there that I think was, I can't remember quite how much it was, but it was a, <clears throat> it was a, a limited production Medoc. Uh, that, that was it one of those <clears throat> black ones with yes. the sort of, yeah. Um, hugely expensive, but it's a, it's a quote unquote a luxury wine. I'm seeing more and more of these. Uh, I think obviously starting with the, the Napa Valley cuvées at 100, 200, 300 dollars, and now we're seeing them from other places. Um, and some of them taste very good, and some don't. But the, the prices are always pretty significant. How, how do you feel about those? I think it's pretty cynical to launch a product specifically to be expensive and be a luxury, but that's a naive view. You know, I come from the north of England, I count pennies. Um, and the luxury market has, until relatively recently, been quite buoyant, especially in Asia. Uh, so I suppose that's why people sit in, in meetings and in you know, corporate headquarters and, and design these things. They don't have much um, attraction for me personally, and they're not designed for me. But yeah. since we have lived, probably still live in a world with quite a lot of billionaires in it, they want something to buy that says they're billionaires, don't they? So fair enough. <laughs> it's a, a very fair point. I've got a question from Philip Quick saying, um, since Michael Broadbent, there's no one you can read um, in one book, or well, yes, now it would be online, who can tell you about any vintage like a Romani Conti 71 or a, a Bechevel 89. Um, how do you, do you feel about that need? Um, well, I mean, he's, he's just got to look at JanicesRobinson.com, hasn't he? But I agree there isn't, now that poor Michael's gone, and I loved his books and they're, they're tasting, it's great to read those tasting notes. Um, it is, it's a shame that, that, that that stuff doesn't appear in book form anymore. But on the other hand, if you consult a web, uh, an online resource, I'm not, you know, there are lots of others, that can give you tasting notes on more than, several tasting notes on the same wine and how mm. the wine is developing. Uh, so that, has, that can, can offer more accurate information, arguably, or more comprehensive sorry, comprehensive rather than accurate um, information than, than a book like Michael's. I can't see anyone doing a book like Michael's anymore mm. because it'll, it gets out of date so uh, rapidly and there is the online com topical alternative nowadays. I can't resist talking about that and going back to the famous <laughs> Pavi uh, Oh, God. So Only not, not about that, but it's about the wine, because you and I actually agreed about that wine, um, that, that vintage, which was huge. And I think we both thought lacking elegance or appeal at the time. And I think you marked it very lowly and I, I rated it low, as did a few other people. I retasted that vintage later and still didn't love it, but I didn't dislike it as much. Are you in terms of the sort of wines we go back to the early days when you were writing back in the 80s when wines would have had alcohol levels of 12 and a half or 13 or whatever quite often with a lot of help from from some help from chapelization en route to the wines today that are 14 plus or whatever and producers trying to make them less how do you see some of those wines are they evolving uh are they developing any kinds of elegance over time that makes them uh, comparable no, and I think one. their era has passed and mm. you people aren't people are, sort of, are boasting about making fresh lower alcohol wines nowadays aren't they and um, they don't boast about high alcohol and lots of concentration and lots of wood so Philip Quick is saying so your wine website Genesis would tell me about a Chateau Longo about 1947 for example well, it might, Philip. I, haven't, I, I would have to look, but, you know, it, ha it has got quite a few tasting notes on, and, on wines of great seniority. Um, but you may be the only person in the world with a, a huge stash of Longo Barton 47. 
<laughs> and can we come round to drink it? <laughs> I think it's the answer. Uh, Philip is in um, Kishnau in, in Moldova, so it's, it's, a, it's a way to go. Um, oh, yeah. I've also got a, 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 a Lentz Moser is asking the question, we're, we're producing that vintage, I reckon a 30% loss of sales during 2020 for all of us globally. What is going to happen with the excess wine, I guess, from all over the world, um, in your view? I think its price will come down, won't it? I think so. I think that's People are already talking about um, making, uh, we've got a very nice dispatch in from Elaine Chukan Brown today about how wineries in California and Oregon are coping with the situation. And they're already talking about making bigger volumes of less expensive wine and cutting down on the kind of single vineyard, more expensive wines, for instance. And I think that will happen globally. Angela, it would be a great time for consumers. Angela Lloyd from South Africa, who I think we both know, said, will we see more launches or suitable wine events done online? So much time and money wasted just going to taste one wine at a farm. Couldn't a launch be done more effectively online? The, the Molinos are launching the next vintage and Blue Passant wines this way. Um, next Tuesday involving several uh, journalists. And we had... Um, uh, Laura um, Katana here yeah. saying the same thing. Yeah. Are no, you Mike's, seeing more people doing this? Yeah, absolutely. You know, along with all those business meetings, really, really makes sense. I mean, you, if, the, it, if they want to launch it to people who they want to describe it, then they're going to have to physically get a sample to people. Uh, and I'm a big fan of um, wine in tubes, mm -hmm. you know, little kind of test tube type things with screw caps. Okay, it's not going to keep the wine for years, but it's a much more um, sustainable way of shipping wine around the world than in a, a 75 centiliter bottle for someone who's going to taste just a, a tasting sample, isn't it? Angela, you're, you're there, I think. You're, are you um, in South Africa right now? Yes, I am, uh, Robert. Yeah, um, Hi. Hello, Jancis. Um, I think... Obviously, it's very different for you in, in England, where you have very many um, invites every day. We are but so here spoiled. We, we were so spoiled. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But here we have um, invites to the Winelands, which is great. But you go out and you hang around, and it's just one wine. And it seems so much more it's sensible. Crazy, crazy and, isn't it? time saving to have um, send a bottle of wine and uh, to to taste it do it in a, a, a way like this with zoom which quickly so, you know then you can discuss it with the winemaker rather than wasting time petrol and thing as mm. as lovely as it is to go to the wines um, but um, I mean, the, it will be very interesting to see how it goes with the Molyneux, who I must say have sent each of us um, the same glass so that we can taste the wine from that. So ah, it will be very interesting. But I do see it as a way forward, um, having read Robert's um, review on uh, today about how we've got to change the world of wine, or it is changing, it's a change to move forward. Yeah. Thank you, Angela. Um, actually, that's, Angela's given you a wonderful uh, opportunity, um, chances to mention uh, glasses. I hope you saw I resisted. The <laughs> I know. So I, I, mean, thought I, I thought I'd take the opportunity <laughs> to do that. How, how is it going as a project? It's great. It's very good. And actually, our, um, my partners at Richard Brendan, who he's the designer who came to see me and sort of nagged me and said, come on. Come on, we, we ought to produce this glass. Um, they've been very um, active in seeking out people doing online tastings and offering them a couple of glasses to demonstrate with and so forth, which is sensible. Um, no, it's lovely. And um, the, the t we're generally in partnership with a fine wine importer in most markets, but the really tough nut to crack is France. Mm -hmm. Because France doesn't have fine wine importers, you know, they, they don't 
think they, they need, need to import wine. Um, and I, I find it very frustrating because I do think France is behind the curve, certainly behind Italy, for instance, in its glassware. And I'm just dying to make an inroad there. And at the moment, what's happening is that most people in France who have my wine glass, because it's a kind of universal, one glass for everything, mm. very, very Marie Kondo, um, tend to be people whose wines are imported into the US by Skernick, the family company in New York, who effectively sort of back sell them to their suppliers, if you see what I mean, which is a bit crazy, isn't it? Now let's assume we've got your ideal glass. We've got other things oh, that yeah, we need yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, by the way, um, I have a question from Louise Hill saying what is in it at the moment. Ah, good question. Well, I thought I would choose a wine that deserves more attention. Uh, so it's sherry, mm -hmm. and it's a, a Manzanilla uh, Enrama from, uh, from um, it, La Gitana. From Lovely, Africa. yes. And it's delicious. Thank you. Um, it's Nick's favourite wine. Um, so I've got um, a very uh, celebrated um, uh, sommelier arriving um, from New York, I think. Is that right, Dylan Proctor? I can't see you, but I think you're there. I'm trying to unmute you. Um, while we're talking, while waiting for, for Lynn to come on, um, how, can I ask you about biodynamic tasting days and the calendar? How do you feel about it? There was a time, you know, when we all became aware of this biodynamic calendar, that we followed it. Um, but I, I've, I've kind of slightly, I've, I've lost consciousness of it, if you like. But do you um, think there are days when wines don't sing? for whatever reason yes but i usually think it's my fault rather than um the, bio the biodynamic calendar's fault i ought to be more rigorous in working it out there are definitely times when i feel i'm tasting really well and really acutely and other times when perhaps i'm distracted or i agree with you absolutely yeah. and maybe Delint, glass maybe it's the glass it's the glass exactly uh, are you there can we can we hear you hi are you there I don't think so. I've got a, while we're waiting, I've got a question from Lorenzo Biscontin in Italy. Um, in the US, produce about in the US producing more quantity of lower quality wines to address the emergency. I don't see people drinking more wine because of lower prices. I expect a boom of wine consumption when the situation will be back to normal. Wouldn't it be better to produce smaller quantity of higher quality wines that can age? Well, it depends what sort of producer you are, but um, I think every at the moment, sales are pretty good, aren't they? Um, people seem to be laying in wine, and those retailers who can supply them are reporting record sales. Uh, so at the, at the moment, it does look as though um, wine drinking is pretty, pretty healthy. Um, and, you, and if we're going to get to a situation where transport is difficult or somebody is... Uh, it, couriers have sort of limits on them and controls on them, then wine is going to stack up in the distribution chain. And so mm. that we'll have to find some, somewhere to go. And uh, it's a lovely idea that, um, yes, people make smaller quantities of more expensive wine, but not everyone can. So I've got Glenn Proctor from New York, is that right? Hi. Hi, guys. No, hi, from hi, Napa hi. Valley. Oh, yeah. okay. Sorry, I got that wrong. Welcome. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for having me. Happy to join on with, uh, with you guys. What time are you there? Sort of some bright and early in the morning? Yeah, it's just shy of noon here, about 11.50, 10 till. It's the time that Michael Broadbent would be having his first glass of Madeira. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> so, um, have you got a question for Jancis? Uh Hey, I, I, I actually do not right now. I was just uh, supporting Thanks. and wanted to, wanted to dive in and listen to you guys. That's all. <laughs> well, welcome anyway. I think that's a, I think we were looking at this. I think that can whole... I Can I jump in while yeah. we have Dylan here? Mm. So actually, um, Jancis, you know, we're, 
a, a big thing that we're dealing with, of course, in all of our markets, but especially in the American market, is recognizing that we need greater diversity in how we talk about wine, how we pair wine with food, how we represent wine, and even the imagery and the language that we use. Can you talk a little bit about how you've seen that change, you know, mm -hmm. over the course of the years and, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, what you've learned and what we can take away from that? You'd like me to talk? Which, uh, mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it's improved. You don't have to be uh, a white man in a pinstripe suit anymore to be in the wine business. But whiteness dominates. We're very, very bad, I think, on racial diversity. Where people have been trying to get more women in, but boof, you know, it's ridiculous, really. And why should that be? Um, I, I don't know. I, I can only assume that people aren't being given good breaks and opportunities. Um, I'm delighted where you are, Glenn, in the, in the Napa Valley. It's, it's good. I mean, where would the Napa Valley be without the labor force, the workforce yeah. in the vineyard? And slowly, slowly, that is being publicly acknowledged. Perhaps as labor is becoming more and more difficult to find, thanks to the lovely wall and so forth. Um, but, in, and, and, and a few, um, you know, Mexican owned wineries is, uh, are in operation and so forth. And that's great. Um, I think it's probably the, the U S that is, I hope going to be in the vanguard of, of better racial diversity. Um, I would suggest that everyone looks out for a, a movie that I'm looking forward to, which was going to be premiered in Cape Town at the end of April, but that's not gonna happen, um, which is about these, the four sommeliers who mm. came from Zimbabwe into South Africa, knowing nothing about wine, no wine background, worked as gardeners, blah, blah, and have ended up being the somms at four, the four top places in Cape Town and competing in a Zimbabwean wine tasting team in the, the uh, world wine tasting championship and it's a it's a lovely story yeah um, but you know it's a small it's a little small little cog in the great tapestry of wine really can i just stitch this part together with where the where we started because chance is you know, having been around for a few years we've got a generational change going on Being as well prehistoric was how, <laughs> That's how right. robert put but, it initially <laughs> but we have got a generational we've got new generations coming into wine today and you've got um, kids and and grandkids you, 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 and grandchildren. Um, how are you seeing that change? Are you seeing because we we hear about millennials looking at wines differently and so on? Is that something you believe in, or is that just um, well? A, I a I think why, uh, pre virus, um, I would have said wine's biggest uh, challenge is declining consumption, particularly among uh, younger people mm. uh, with massive challenge from craft spirits, craft beers, cocktails, and teetotalism, and just not wanting to drink alcohol at all. And certainly, for the first time in my professional life, uh, wine total volume of wine sold in the UK is going down. And I've just lived through a period when it just went up and up and up. And same for you, Robert. I mean. mm. And I mean, do you think that we as a, uh, does the wine world need to communicate differently to yeah. the new generations, um, you think? I'm not sure how it came about that, that suddenly beer and spirits came to be, to sort of nab the, the term craft and it never being applied to wine when, of course, you know, you, you can't produce most wine without an excess of craftsmanship. Um, we, we obviously haven't sold it very well um, and it will take all sorts of things probably things that we haven't thought of but you know think about say Gary Vaynerchuk who was mm -hmm. a you know a real pioneer of doing this kind of thing his um, wine library tv and so forth um, well he opened up wine to a whole generation of American potential mm. consumers and would never have been predicted and I'm um, all sorts of funny things happen, don't they, to, to have a major effect on, on wine consumption, like sideways, um, you know, suddenly Pinot Noir's hot, uh, like the, um, actually, 
all three things I'm mentioning are on screens because the mm. other thing was that 60 minutes documentary yeah. in the US which told everyone that the Mediterranean diet was the healthiest and you had to drink red wine if you wanted to live a long time. I have to say that anybody who hasn't seen it, your encounter with Gary Vaynerchuk <laughs> on YouTube is one of the best bits of <laughs> video I've seen Very in funny. a long time. <laughs> it's, it's glorious. Um, and he was so excited to have you there as, as, as I am here. But um, I think that uh, it, was, it was a fascinating encounter. I think. <laughs> Um, yeah, but very, um, his, very different people. Yes, exactly. But I think maybe we need a new Gary Vaynerchuk, possibly yeah. today. But well, he's you have, kind of left wine for yeah. pastures even more lucrative, really, hasn't he? And you kind of alluded to, to this earlier, but you've become, uh, whether you, you planned this, I don't know, when you started um, uh, JanceRobbins.com, which you were a pioneer, in fact, in terms of, of going online, um, as so many other outlets for writers have fallen away you actually are now probably one of the the most um, prominent wine publishers in um around and well it's uh, happened by accident and by a lot of hard graft and um thanks to a great team of contributors and backroom people you know they we thanks to polly we're here you know it's always you 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 need people who who you know in our case upload tasting make it happen yeah all the software and so forth so uh it's it's a very varied team and in fact the the longest serving member of it is uh rachel shaughnessy who's been looking after the membership all this time all sorts of facets to it i remember you telling me at one point your your audience the ft audience and your the chances robinson.com audience was and I may have got this wrong, but I think it was a third, 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 sort of third UK, third expat Brits, and a third non-Brits. Is that was that right at the time? Um, the I think it's changed a lot for the FT. Uh, Britain became its uh, was was no longer. I think America overtook the UK some time ago. For us on the website, it's about sort of just it's sort of high thirty percent UK, I think, low thirty percent US and then about another 85 countries or something. Um, and you're going to be, we're going to let you go because we're nearly at the hour and I think we've got something yeah. else to do. But um, you've, you've been very busy on the website <laughs> in the last, um, well, since the, the, the crisis has started. So we're looking at the moment at, as you said, in terms of where people can buy wine. Have you got any other plans of what you're going to be doing in the next few, few days? Well, there's the hospitality offer. People, That's really, yeah. Yeah. The, um, as offer two out of work hospitality professionals, um, wanting them to share what we have for nothing. Um, and our reports are just pouring in from all over the world of, of different facets of what this, what the effects of this extraordinary situation. So we'll be publishing um, quite a few of those over the next week or so. But as I say, I, I'm very aware it hasn't got to become you know, the coronavirus center. It, we've got to have some play and education and entertainment and, and, and recommendation. Because after all, that's probably the single biggest thing people want from people like me. Go there, buy that. Jancis, thank you very, very much for your, for your time this evening. Uh, I really you. appreciate it. It's been, well, it's I, 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 to I've friend. enjoyed it. <laughs> and um, anybody who'd like to come, um, we're opening the bar, the, the virtual bar, and you can see it on the, the chat um, little box there. And you can just turn up there using that password. And we will be pouring free um, DRC Marache all evening. Um, virtually, but uh, and Jancis, you're very welcome as well. But you may have other things to do. But Jancis, thank you very much. And anybody who's watching this, do go to have a look at at, at um, jancisrob.com. There's, there's a lot of interesting stuff coming in there, as Jancis was saying. So thank you. Thanks. Bye. Goodbye, thank you, all, and see thank you in the bar. Thank you. Bye. Bye.